Joining us now, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas. We are capping off our week-long discussion of his new book entitled The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. Also with us, presidential historian and Pulitzer Prize-winning author, Doris Kearns Goodwin. And Richard, you, you write about uh, country over party in the book saying that, quote, the obligation to put the country and American democracy before party and person is a thread that helps bind the fabric of this society and is an essential element of patriotism. Putting democracy and the country founded on it first is the only way to preserve and better yet improve a United States of America that for any and all of its shortcomings and flaws is still the most successful political experiment in human history and the one with the greatest potential. And, and Doris, I'll let you kick it off, but um, where we started with Rusty Bowers, I mean, there are people who have stepped up in this country's time of need. Uh, the problem is a lot of people didn't. Absolutely. And what I think is so profound about what Richard has written, I've been waiting for this book, I think, for a long time, <laughs> is that in the end, it all comes down it all comes down to character. Right, Richard? That's what you say. And I think yeah. about Teddy Roosevelt, who said that the power of a president is most exemplified in the power of example that you want. And he said his most important role was that of being citizens. All this stuff you talk about. Or I think of George Bush Sr., who wrote about his mother, who wanted him to be fiercely competitive. But on the other hand, she wanted him to win with, with humility and to lose with grace and to be a good teammate. He came home one day and he said, I scored three goals in, in soccer. Well, how did the team do, she said. So somehow I think what you've done in this book, Richard, I'd like to ask whether it was intended that character in some ways becomes the ultimate sum of what allows a person to put democracy above self. It's character, and you can teach it by coaching by parents, by example, by leaders. And what's been so sad about our current situation is people at the highest level not accepting yep. loss with grace. So I, I, I'd love to hear you talk about it, Richard. I'm so glad you wrote this book. Well, thank you, Doris. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. I didn't start out there, but I ended up there. And the more I looked at American history, the more I looked at politics, to get people to act the right way is not something you can legislate or mandate as a matter of law. It's in some ways explains how I came to the whole concept of obligation, the things you should do or, or ought to do rather than can be compelled uh, to do. And there's good examples of in history. You're more familiar than I am, say, with uh, profiles and courage, either people who stood fast by principle when that was called for, or people who were prepared to compromise when compromise made them politically vulnerable. And what's so interesting to me is you can model it. Uh, you can have religious leaders and authorities, I think, you know, call for it. You can have teachers call for it. Parents can uh, demonstrate it and talk to their children about it. You can do everything about it, though, again, but require it. And that's where the voters come in. I think at the end of the day, it's a little bit up to us to say, we're going to vote for people or support people who show this, who do the right thing, virtue or character, and we're going to penalize those who don't. We've got a lot of people in Washington right now who are not demonstrating uh, character. So I think it's up to us. They're not going to change, most likely. So it's up to us, if you will, to change who, who, who gets to represent us. So, Richard, what seems to be, as you just mentioned, an increasing, increasingly rare thing for public figures, politicians, to put, to put country first, to not choose politics or their even personal gain. We, we all spoke much, many times this summer about Liz Cheney, uh, a rare moment who put uh, patriotism over party. Uh, how worried are you, though, that, that, that she is the, by far the exception rather than the rule? Do you see others out there? Do you have any hope that this could be a, a growing trend? Well, I think some of the secretaries of state uh, around the country who stood fast in Pennsylvania and other states who pushed back what you just heard from Mr. Powers, I thought was, was remarkable. The idea, here's this Republican. He almost wanted to do the wrong thing because politically, it would have served his interest to do the wrong thing. But morally and ethically, he couldn't do the wrong thing. This is a religious country. This is a moral country. So I don't think it's impossible. I don't think what we're talking about is, uh, is a pipe dream. Again, but lots of people have to step up. The leaders of this society have to be willing to demonstrate it and call for it. I mean, I'd be curious what Doris thinks uh, about this, about what it is, she, you know, where she sees it and where she thinks, uh, how she thinks we can generate, if you will, more of it. 
Well, I think the word generate is an important word because it's interesting. Certain generations, there's a cycle of history where people are more other-minded, where public issues cut across private lives in a greater way. Obviously, it happens during wars, you know, the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, but it also happened during peacetime, the turn of the 20th century, that progressive movement. There were settlement houses. There were people who cared about making the democracy stronger. It happened in the 1960s. I mean, I'm so glad I grew up in the 1960s, even though it had lots of difficulties during that period, there was that civil rights movement. There was the sense of what John Kennedy was calling on people, you know, to care more about what they could do for their country than what their country could do for them. So it's a contagion. I mean, I remember being at the Civil Rights March in 1963. It was one of the greatest moments in my life in a certain sense, because I felt part of something larger than myself as I was marching along, carrying those signs. I felt like we were making a better world. And indeed, that march helped to produce the Civil Rights Act and then later the Voting Rights Act. So that some Sometimes you've just got to get enough people doing it. And I think, as you say, Richard, in the book, when you do that, when you put that ahead of your own personal self, it's a great feeling. You feel larger. You're connected to something bigger. Isn't that right? No, absolutely. When, another example I was thinking of was after 9-11, when my, when my boss at the time, President George W. Bush, went to the mosque. And just to basically say to Americans, these are our fellow Americans. Treat them as our fellow Americans. Don't mm -hmm. have collective, if you will, guilt for what the for the terrible actions of a few. That that to me, that was character in action. That was truly an admirable sort of sort of action. So, Richard, what does it tell you that we hold up um, as exceptions, unfortunately, people like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, Republicans, who stood up and did something that to most of us was an obvious thing, which is to say an attempted coup against the United States government is a bad thing. But even people who stepped away from Donald Trump in that moment around January 6th are back at his side and quickly rushed back to his side. What does it tell you about the incentives that our politicians have to really not put country first when push comes to shove? Well, it tells you just that. So what we have to do is change the incentive structure. It means voters, and it might take independents as, and Democrats as well as uh, some Republicans to, to send the message. What we want is our, our political leaders to be responsive to, to good incentives, to act, re to act re responsibly when their 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 narrow poli political instincts are not, and then we need others in the society also to to speak out, to speak out to this. Educators, this is what teachers are meant to teach. Religious leaders are meant to introduce a moral element to our lives. Parents are meant to try to raise their children in in, in ways which are which are admirable. So I don't think it's gonna gonna happen all of a sudden. I don't think it's gonna happen by a magic wand. But it is going to take work at the, if you will, at the ground level. And ultimately, enough voters are going to have to get involved and basically make clear that people who act, who do not put country first, to put it bluntly, they will not be given the, the opportunity to, to lead. And those who do be, put country first, even where there's some political disagreements, they will be voted for. But until that happens, I think we're going to see uh, more of what we, we've seen, unfortunately. Richard Haas, thank you so much. The new book is The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens, and we're all glad you wrote the book. Thank you very much uh, for your book residency this week. And Doris Kearns Goodwin, thank you as well. Always great to see you.